episode seven. Seven. Hey guys, welcome back. All right, let's get this done. Now, while you were gone, I fixed my got a new lamp, so that won't be falling over on me. And I found out who maxed up my bench, but since he's related to me, I can't say anything more. All right, I forgot to cut the end off of this one last time, just before we ended, so we'll come back in here. Now, let me just tell you a little something about that. I like to cut from the same side. It just allows me to get really good at doing it, and that's a difficult cut on that shoulder. So, I tend to always, or at least as often as possible, cut so that my saw is on the left side of the line. It also allows me to have both fingers behind the saw, whereas if I cut the opposite way, I end up, uh, I end up having to sit like this, keep my thumb out of the way, and it's just not quite as comfortable. Hope that made sense. Did it, Frank? I think so. Okay. Now, before I chop the uh, waste, I'm going to come in here and just clean up that little bit of material that's left in there. I want to check these to make sure I don't have too much excess. You hone right in on that. I don't want excess material sitting up above. And you see where there is right here? If you get in there real close, you can see the scribe line, and there's still stock above it. Well, can't have that because that's going to prevent that joint from going together the way I want. So I'll come in here and just take a little cut. This is what I try to avoid. I would prefer to be able to take this right from the saw and not have to do this. However, you got to be prepared to do it occasionally. Can't get them right every time. Get rid of that material. Check that one. That one looks clean. And then check this one. The same thing. A little bit of stock right above. The smallest of them. Am I moving that too fast or are you able to get it? No, a little too fast. But... Okay. Anytime I use a chisel like this, I always choke up. So I'm right up by the tip. I have lots of control. If I slip, it's not going to go too far into me. Okay. Now could do that one before I go ahead and start chiseling these, but I'm going to take the opportunity to teach it to you twice. Alright, so we're starting on the inside. I've got a 3 16 chisel with a really acute angle on it. That's about 17 degrees that grind on that bevel. Now I'll come in here, back some of that off, go down about a third. See that? There's way too much material right here. Just a sec, I can't see. Okay, come on over my right shoulder. If you don't do this, it's just, especially on pine, there's too much of a tendency for that chisel to push back by my scribe line. Too much material right there. See that? Yeah. All right, well, what I'm going to do is come in here and just back some of it off first, then set my chisel in the scribe line, go down about a third of the distance. Now I'll flip it over and do the same on this one. I, uh, I anchor the chisel with, I'll show you, this finger so that I can more accurately place it instead of sitting up here in midair and then trying to drop it right on that line. So this way I have a little more control and I can drop that exactly where I want it. Good clean marking gauge line will allow the chisel to drop in there and just lock it. So critical. Okay, now finish this from this side. Chop down until you meet. Now on this side where I was very, very light with the marking gauge line, you really have to have a sharp cutter so that you because I can't even see the line but I can feel it with the chisel keep the chisel perpendicular don't or avoid the the uh, desire to undercut if you keep it plumb Jake if you keep it plumb as you chop the pressure will eventually build up and if you've got a nice light grip on the chisel toward the middle it'll start to undercut well that does two things that you want one is it provides you a good square shoulder up here should you have to remove more material than you anticipated 
in a cleanup phase. If you were to undercut right from the beginning, you'd end up exposing a gap. So the first third of it is going to give you a nice square shoulder, and then it'll eventually undercut slightly so that you're ensure, you're ensure that there is not a bump in there that would prevent the joint from seating or cause you more work to have to go in after the fact and clean it up. I've cut a few of these, you know. Okay, set that chisel in there. You could easily, in fact, Alan Peters rarely would use a mallet. He would actually push the chisel through, but I find with a mallet, I can apply as little or as much force as I want. So, my preference. Okay, Jake, bring me another bad lamp. All right, choke up, work from front to back, or from outside to inside. That way, if I slip, the damage is reserve, uh, confined to the inside and not going to be on the outside. I'm just going to clean that waste out. Now, I want to make sure that those corners are nice and clean. So I'll come in here with my chisel, if I need to, and just a little paring cut. If I had taken my saw cut right to the line, I wouldn't have to do this. And I did for the most part, so there's just a little bit in there. All right, so the nice, clean corners is going to produce a good joint. On this side. Okay, a little bit of debris in there. Again, work front to back. Hold the chisel in such a way that it's I can push firmly, but should it jump, it's not going to tear out on the inside. Okay, so that one's done. Let's go ahead and finish off this other one. Let's do that process again. This time we'll do it with the lamp. We'll see a little bit better. I like to uh, I like to position the lamp so that it illuminates the end and the face. Okay. Come in here. Move this onto position so that all I see is red pen line. Let's go ahead and, and uh, outline that baseline too this time. May as well make it a little bit easier if I can. The saw cut right to the bottom. When I do this, by the way, I usually have my saw tip just a few degrees toward the back. That way when I make it to the line here, I know I'm at the line if not a little bit lower on the inside. It's not going to show and it prevents me from having to go in there with a chisel and carve out a whole lot of material. Okay, reposition the lamp. You want to stay on that side or you want to get on my left shoulder? I always hold onto the board with my opposite hand. It just, uh, I call it closes the circuit. Gives you a little more control. And on a small board, I can actually hold onto the piece of wood and keep it from vibrating as I saw. Keep the sawdust out of the teeth so they don't drop on the line, obscure it. Not exactly three minutes and 40 seconds, is it? You were much younger then. You couldn't do that yeah. anymore. Yeah, that was a long time ago. All right, let's flip that over and do this. So where are you gonna start looking for a new job? I think we'll go ahead and square these. Let's do that again.
Okay, now, that vertical cut. Position the lamp. Remember with the fret saw to just twist it over so that you can slide down there, come up off of the bottom, turn a little bit, cut as close to the line as you dare. The closer you cut, the less waste you have to chisel. Lay that on its side, get it sitting level. Got that red piece of uh, bloodwood inlaid into my bench, and I can just eyeball across the top. Makes it quite easy. Illuminate that just the way I want. I'm going to keep that fairly low in the vise. Prevents it from vibrating. A lot of people don't understand what I mean when I say split the line. Let me show you on this next one. When we use that marking gauge, it leaves a somewhat of a V-shape cut in the wood. So when I'm done, this half or the waste half of the V needs to be gone. The other half of the V needs to stay with the piece. If I remove any of it, then I've taken too much and we're going to end up with a potential gap. So splitting the V means taking half of it, leaving half of it. Of course, the piece that you take is out with the saw curve. All right. Check those. So that's, see that? Nice and clean. Oh, I love it when I see that. Perfect. Nice clean cut. Well, if they were all like that. Nothing, nothing to be done. Just got a little bit of material to remove right here. You can't get that out with the saw. All right, let's chop these. <coughs> so once again, hold that. I like to. Uh, by the way, you may see my stance instead of bending over injuring your back or straining it. I just spread my legs so I can drop my height, keep my back up, or keep my back straight. Makes it much more comfortable. Got a backup block, or a waist block, sacrificial block on the bench, starting on the inside. That lamp so I can see. Get rid of the bulk of the waist, set the marking gauge in the line. Remember to go down just about a third. Doesn't take a lot. I'm moving that stuff too fast. Oh, your hand's just in the way. Put that over. Set that in the marking gauge. Careful when you go down, don't go blowing out the other side. You gotta keep that line perfect. If you twist, allow your chisel to twist at all. It's the reason why it's important to have somewhat of a light touch so that the chisel will fall into the scribe line and stay there. Say a little something about 
chisels too while I'm doing this. You need good beveled edge chisels with plenty of relief on the side. If your chisels have a big wide flat spot, you see that little flat landing, that little section right there that is actually square to the bottom? No bigger than that. If, you, if yours doesn't have that, when you come in here, you're going to be bruising the side of the tail in order to get into that corner. So good beveled edge chisels will have a very small landing down there and then enough relief angle that allows you in between the tails. Okay, punch out that waist. Check those corners for nice. I want them to be nice and sharp. Remember to choke up on the chisel so that you have lots of control. Always working front to back. Fair bit I need to be removed right there. Okay. Good square corners. All right, both those sides are good to go. How are we for time? Uh, you got 13 minutes. Excellent. We can get those pins marked out. Okay, this is the uh, stage where you have to be so precise. If you miss on the layout, you're in trouble. You can do great tails, and I've had students who make perfect dubbed tails, but then they don't get that layout proper, or they don't get the transfer of tails to pins done properly, and consequently they lose their fit. So I'm going to take, I'm going to do the end one first, the, the easy one. Number one and number one, make sure you put your marks in there. I'm going to grab a, uh, I'm going to grab a block plane to do this next bit. Here. Turn it on its side, set that pin board down in, keep it flush with the top, move it back, and that's number one, so this is number one. Alright, this is a little bit complicated because normally you're building a box or a drawer you have one groove to worry about which would be the groove down here that houses the bottom we're gonna have a groove top and bottom the point in making that I was making is that whenever I lay these two out I always would make sure that the bottoms are flush that way the groove lines up but we've got a groove in the top too so in that case these pieces have to be exactly the same thickness which they are okay now Got to set that in position. All right, I'm looking down this shoulder, this shoulder and this shoulder to make sure that they have that face of that shoulder, which would be right here, is exactly on the inside same on the exact same plane as the inside face of the pin board. Show that again. This face of this shoulder has to be on the exact same plane as the inside face of the pin board. So when you get it into position, try to look straight down. Oftentimes guys will be doing this and they see a gap, they move it over, but if they were actually to look down so that they're looking right along this edge, they're inside. So it's a bit tricky at best. That's the reason why I like to use that little rabbit that I I use so often but I couldn't do it here so I almost ignore this back line because the thing will it'll fit if that shoulder is in the right spot okay now I'm gonna do this carefully I don't want to leave marking gauge lines or dovetail marks out here on this end lap so I've got to pull this through Make this mark and stop right on that line. Keep the knife tight to the side of the tail, drag it through, and then do your best to stop it right there. When I, this is my own marking knife. In fact, it'll be available fairly soon, but I modified, I made it 
to do this particular job. And that flat bevel right there lays up against the side of the tail. There's a little tiny center bevel that prevents the edge from actually cutting the side of the tail. So you'll notice what I do, and you may be able to get, if you get straight across from me right now, you'll be able to see this a little bit better. What I'm going to do, I'm holding this firmly with my left hand. You may have to come up. Now I'm going to approach the side of the tail in a bit of an angle. And then I bend the blade so that the flex in the blade prevents that tip from wandering in the end grain. Now I do all of one side before I stop and do the other. So now I'll come back this way. Bend it against the side of the tail and then drag it through. Careful to stop right there at the end lap. Don't push down too hard. Okay, now before I move it, I'm going to use my lamp to verify that those lines are in the right spot, and they are. So I'll go ahead, lift that off, and then I'm going to chamfer. You want to catch this. I'm going to take my chisel and I'm going to chamfer the inside corners. And because this is a, a, a half blind, I can chamfer all the way out to the end, whereas on a through dovetail I'd have to step in here about a sixteenth. This one I can take the entire corner off. And not only does it help the joint go together, but it prevents the glue from getting shoved down to the bottom of the joint. That little chamfer will actually channel some of the glue up in as you assemble. Choke up on the chisel. And then just come in here and clip these off. Now by doing this during the uh, assembly phase or during the construction phase, if I happen to pick this piece up again mistakenly and go to lay this one out when I should be using the other piece, I'll notice that they're already chamfered so I know, okay, if this has already been done. Okay, so we can set that aside. Now we'll come in here, turn this around so I can see it. I'm going to run some reference lines. You might want to be on this side, Frick. I'm going to run some reference lines. Oh, look at it. I forgot to do that. I can't believe I did that. I need to get my marking gauge. We didn't, we didn't, uh, I didn't lay out. I didn't scribe the inside of these. Okay, when I do this, I'm going to, I want this, when I assemble, these sides are absolutely, actually a little bit proud of the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the marking gauge, get right up close here. I'm going to set the marking gauge so that it's a little bit less than the thickness of the tailboard. Face it uh, towards me a little bit if you can. I'm going to see if I got it. Yep. Okay, can you see that? Yep. Just a little bit less than, not much. Lock it. And then I'll take that setting and I scribe it on the inside faces. Okay, that's the top. Now I don't want that to come all the way up because I don't want to see it. No, no, it's hidden. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to confuse you. Scribe the inside face. Turn my dovetail marker on its side and come in here and run some scribe or some uh, reference marks. From that scribe line up to those marks I just made. in the end grain. Okay, identify the waste. Now I'm going to go ahead and cut this one. This time, whereas we normally would keep that as low in the vise as possible, I've got to be able to saw on an angle. So I've got to keep that up as much as I can. I grab my level so that I can make sure that that is standing plumb. 
And the reason I do this is because making these vertical cuts is the most critical cut in the whole dovetail process. It doesn't matter whether you cut tails first or pins first. The pins come down, the, the pins come down onto, or the tails, pardon me, come down onto the pins. And if these cuts slope and they create a wedging effect at the bottom, something's going to split. If they create a wedging effect at the top and they get narrow at the bottom, then you're going to have a gap. So these cuts must be perpendicular. If your saw has a pistol grip so that it registers in your hand the same way every time you pick it up, gravity will train you to make a plumb cut or will make you, will train you in, in making you know, some plumb cut. The fact that this piece is standing plumb means in no time at all with very little practice you'll actually be able to make these cuts by feel alone. You don't have to look at the line. Okay, what I can do here, or the only thing I can do here with the saw is make a saw cut from this scribe line to this scribe line. And that cut, although it doesn't do a whole lot, is very critical to the rest of the process, as you'll see as we proceed. So I grabbed the wrong saw again. Go back to my white one. Get my lamp just right. So you're, the lamp is invaluable because you can highlight these knife marks. I don't want to. I don't want these highlighted with chalk dust or a pencil or anything. I want to see the actual knife mark, and I can. I can position the lamp so that it drops shadows in these lines and makes them easier to see. It's a little bit different. I'm accustomed to starting in the back because I cut through dovetails probably more than I cut half blinds. This time I'm going to actually start on the front and work my way back. I want to pay all, I just want to devote all my attention to this saw cut along here. These are somewhat hidden. That's why if you can make plumb cuts by feel alone, it is such an advantage. A lot of pressure against my thumb and finger. Start the cut. Very light touch. Don't go beyond either scribe line. Move to the next one. I don't want this to sound like a commercial, but having that, those little teeth in the front are so advantageous when it comes to getting this cut started. Boy, these small ones can be so tedious. Okay, reposition. I'm just going to change this lamp. Is there still something jammed down that hole, Jake? No, I can't believe it where it is then. Try to get that where it'll highlight those knife marks. Now this one's a little bit more difficult because I've got to move my thumb out of the way so that I can see the line. So I compensate by pushing a little bit harder against my index finger so I have a little more control over that where that saw starts. I'll often make a little cut pull away, look and see where it is in relation to the line, because at this phase, at this stage, I could still move it if I needed to, but that's, that started right where I wanted. All right, that's all I can do with the dovetail saw as far as the half blind pins go. I'm go ahead, turn that over, and lay it the other side. Flush that up, set that back, and that's number two. Make sure that bottom is flushed up. Get those shoulders lined up with the inside face of the pin board. Double check that. Okay, that looks good. The reason I do this little bridge is because if I was trying to do this same procedure with the tailboard sitting on the bench, so much more surface area, it would slide much easier. This way, 
same amount of pressure, smaller surface area, better chance of keeping this from moving. Come in, press the saw laterally, or press the saw against the side of the tail at about a 10, 15 degree angle, and then carefully drag that through and stop right on that line. It went over that one a little bit. I must be nervous. Position the lamp. The other nice thing about this knife is instead of having coming to a point like so many others do, it's actually round at the tip so that when you're dragging it through the end grain, there's a section of blade. Shoot. There's a section of blade in there and it helps to track the knife. It went over there. Hopefully you won't be able to see it. Okay, check with the lamp. Make sure the cuts are in the right spot. Remove that. Come in here and chamfer these inside edges. Not too much, but enough to do the job. Now remember, if we've done something that's left you wondering, or it wasn't clear, go on the form, ask the question, and maybe before, hopefully before we shoot the next episode, we'll be able to go on and uh, and do the answer on camera if it need be. Okay, so that has already been identified as having been used. Remember to store your pieces on edge so that they absorb or give off moisture evenly then you don't end up with cup boards after the fact. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, run these reference lines down here. That'll be the last thing we get to do in this episode. Next week we'll come in and we'll finish off these. Get that other pin board cut down to size. And this will start to come together. All right, so Jake, we just finished episode what? Seven. Seven. So episode eight on the